Brian Barnett is just a regular guy. He's not a doctor. He has no legal license in any field of mental or emotional health. Brian Barnett merely shares the insights he's gained from his personal experiences for anybody who may choose to use such information as he or she personally chooses while accepting full responsibility for his or her own individual thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and actions. Brian Barnett assumes no responsibility whatsoever for anybody's individual choice to expose himself or herself to any information that Brian Barnett shares. And by listening to this program, you're acknowledging that you, and only you, are responsible for your own thoughts, feelings, and actions. Test them, test them, test them. Happy Thursday, everybody. Welcome back to The Last Symptom. I'm Brian Barnett, the creator and host. I'm so glad you could be here this week, or, you know, maybe this is your first time. Either way, it's good to see you. Glad you're here. And I'm looking forward to discussing the topic of the day. The topic of the day is going to be boundaries, dealing with family that you've placed boundaries on. Before we get into this discussion, I'd like to remind you about my website for free resources over at thelastsymptom.com. There's a lot there for new people to discover. If you're a longtime follower, maybe you've noticed that I haven't added any new content over there recently. Pretty soon... We'll be throwing lots of content regularly back up on the, the site over there at thelastsymptom.com. But while you're there, uh, if you'd like to leave a donation to support my overall body of work, that would be very helpful. Or if you'd like to schedule a one-on-one conversation with me to maybe see if I can help you sort some things out, you can do that right from thelastsymptom.com. Well, let's get into it. How to deal with family that you've placed boundaries on. Let's make a correction to that word in here before we even get started. When we talk about boundaries, are boundaries something we put on other people? You know, I did a three-part series of this back during the first season of this show. might be worthwhile to go back and refresh your memory on that whole discussion about boundaries. Uh, But let's ask a question again. Are boundaries something we put on other people or put around other people? The true nature of a healthy boundary is something we put around ourselves. So in everyday speech, we say things like, I put a boundary on my dad, or, uh, you know, how do we deal with family members that we've put boundaries on? Uh, But that wording is not accurate. The thing that's more accurate to say is boundaries we've created are around ourselves or created for ourselves in relation to family or boundaries that I've put around myself in relation to my father. That's that distinction right there. Boundaries aren't something that we put on other people. It's not a way to try to control other people. It's uh, not a way to try to get them to do things we want them to do. That is not what a healthy boundary is. A healthy boundary is, if you can imagine... If you're a visual person, imagine uh, a castle with a moat. The moat is your boundary, and you're the castle. And guess who is in total control over the drawbridge? That's right, it's you. So every, every one of us is a castle with a moat around us, and each one of us is people. We get to decide everything that happens within the walls of our castle. Unhealthy people who don't understand how to create healthy boundaries just leave the drawbridge down all the time. <laughs> so then they suffer all the bad influences and the frustrations that people bring into their castle, and then they wonder why. Why are their lives so miserable? Well, we're going to get into that today. Um, And actually, this was an article that I wrote last year about this time. Somebody said, uh, one topic, topic, if it hasn't already been covered, is how to deal with your long-distance parents when you have borderline personality disorder after you put up boundaries and they use Christmas or the holidays to place guilt on you to engage. 
Well, I can't believe it's been a year since I wrote this article, but it was up on my old website, and uh, I never, I don't believe I ever turned this into a, a podcast episode. So I'm going to take advantage today to do that because uh, maybe Yuns are dealing with some of these same issues now that we've come full circle and we're back right around to about the same time of year. So the boundaries issue is something that all of us are dealing with. Even I myself still deal with this issue from time to time. In fact, uh, it come up just a short weeks before I wrote this article originally. And you might be saying, Brian, Brian still deals with this? But I thought he was cured and all of his problems were over. <laughs> well, yeah, I still deal with it. Uh, there are lots of things I deal with which complicate my life and create moments of stress. Uh, and just like I explained in the last episode of this podcast, you got to keep in mind that I've never told you that genuine recovery equals being happy all the time. When we talk about genuine recovery, we're talking about genuine underlying contentment. And why is a person content? Well, they're content because their perspective on life, self, and feelings harmonize with what life, self, and feelings really are, the nature of those things. And so what a person ends up with is a pretty harmonious life, the way that they navigate life, approach life. I find a lot of great harmony in my way of doing things now, which brings an underlying sense of peace and contentment. Now, what's the difference between genuine underlying contentment and, let's say, being happy? Well, not to give you any ideas or anything, but people who are on the verge of suicide, they experience moments of happiness. They go to parties and they laugh and they have a good time. But are they content? Well, clearly they're not. Inside of them where contentment should be, there's instead heavy discontent and gloom. And, you know... Uh, Something I also mentioned in the last episode is that I never bring up the Bible when I can avoid it out of respect for atheist followers and people of other uh, beliefs. But uh, the following verse is just too appropriate not to share. In Proverbs fourteen thirteen, this is taken from the Byington Bible. It says, even in laughter, a heart will feel pain. So that's exactly what I just described. You know, a person who's on the verge of suicide, going to a party, laughing at jokes, enjoying himself more or less, but not being content, not having underlying contentment. So happiness and contentment are not the same things. Gravely depressed people still experience moments of happiness. What authentic recovery results in is genuine underlying contentment. Like I said, the way you're approaching life, you, you have an understanding of life that is accurate. And that accurate understanding brings harmony to the way you approach things and navigate life. Still, there are plenty of things that uh, stress me out or upset me appropriately at times. And one of these things is my dad. And would you like to know why that's so? Well, it's because emotionally unhealthy people do not recognize or respect boundaries. And my dad is not an emotionally healthy person. Emotionally unhealthy people are never going to respect boundaries. In fact, this is one of the major identifying aspects between an emotionally healthy person and an emotionally unhealthy person. So the boundary I have in place around myself in regards to my father is that as long as he's not showing genuine interest in recognizing and understanding the emotional damage he caused me, as well as working to understand the reasons for why he did the things the way he did them, then he and I cannot have any contact whatsoever. I've explained this to him in no uncertain terms at least three times in very long, eloquent letters, starting back in 2014. My requirement, therefore, fundamentally involves a demonstration from him that first, 
He accepts responsibility for what he did. And secondly, that he feels genuine remorse for it. And the way that he can demonstrate genuine remorse is the way any person who feels genuine remorse would behave. They would try to get to the bottom of why they were able to behave that way in the first place. What, what about their perception of life or what about the way they were raised allowed them to mistreat people that they claim to love? The man refuses, and he's been refusing since I created this boundary. And you know what? I'm convinced he's going to keep right on refusing, straight into the grave. Still, I hold out hope that he'll have an epiphany and prove me wrong. I truly do. I think it's unlikely, but I have not uh, let go of that hope. So let me explain my boundary just a little in a little bit more detail. But basically, in my letter, what I said to him was that he had to regularly be reaching out for help to understand what he did and how he was able to do it and why he did it, and the, the root causes behind all that. And so I implied pretty strongly that that meant going to see a therapist regularly. Like I said, I wrote the first letter in 2014, and then I think I waited a year. After that year passed, I felt like I understood more. So I felt like it was fair and right with my my stronger understanding of things to sit down and give him the benefit of the doubt and write another letter. And the, I'll tell you, the second letter I wrote, it was much more respectful. Instead of just sounding angry, uh, and demanding. Um, it was a lot more respectful. And I tried to appeal to him that this would be a good thing for him, that this was in his best interest to do this for himself. Um, and then a couple more years passed. So about 2016, I wrote the third letter. Again, time had passed. I felt like I had a a stronger perspective on, on the healthy way of handling the situation. I decided to give him the benefit of the doubt again. And I wrote a third letter, which I explained things in great detail. What I expressed in that letter uh, was enough. You know, I'd given him three, I'd given him the bit of the fit of the doubt three times. And uh, the timing was right for that third letter. And I feel even now, I feel like that letter was thorough, fair, comprehensive, and um, respectful. Now, when I said regularly, did I mean every day? Nope. My boundary is that he has to be demonstrating genuine interest in understanding what he did to us and why and how. And in I think it was in my third letter, I explained that this could be once a week. It could be once every month. It could be once every three months, as long as it was regular. And he won't do it. He will not do it. So now, are my father's decisions up to me? Do I have any control over my father's decisions? No, I don't. His decisions are entirely his right, and it's his right to choose not to meet my requirements for relationship. But it's my right to have that requirement in place. So who is responsible, really, for all of these wasted years we're missing out on, and that he will surely look back and have profound regrets over at the end of his life? After all, I'm the one who put the requirement in place, right? I created the boundary for myself. Well, while he would certainly love for me to believe that I'm responsible for the current impasse we're both in, this sort of thinking is just more of the same of his distorted, selfish perspective. The reality is that my father is entirely responsible for the fact that he and I can't have contact. Do you understand why? 
A person on the outside looking at things on the surface would say, oh, Brian's responsible for he and his father not having a relationship. But is that, is, is that what's happening? All I've said is that here, this is what my healthy requirements are for anybody who wants to be in my life. Who is making the decision then to not be in my life? Let's put it this way. Could he be in my life if he wanted to be? Yes, sure he could. Would he have to do anything impossible in order to be in my life? No. He wouldn't even have to do anything slightly difficult. So let me ask it again. Who is responsible for the fact that my father and I are missing all of these years? That we could be enjoying each other's company. In my circumstances, my boundaries, a healthy requirement created in the best interests of my emotional health, but also created in the best interests of his emotional health. And it's also in the best interests of the relationship so that we can have the healthiest type of relationship. It exists for the best interests of both of us. I haven't simply turned my back on anybody. Rather, I've said, until now, you've been an overwhelmingly emotionally abusive, negative force in my life. Now notice, I'm not saying that my father never had any positive influence on me at all. What I'm saying is that the negative influence or the negative force that he represented in my life was greater than the positive force that he represented. That's my qualification for who I don't allow in my life. If you represent a greater positive force than a negative force, welcome, come right in. I'm not looking for perfection. If I did that, I wouldn't have any friends, wouldn't have any family that I could spend time with. I mean, I'd be living alone on an island, and then I wouldn't even be able to put up with myself. No, all I've said is that until now, you've been an overwhelmingly emotionally abusive negative force in my life, greater than anything positive you were bringing to my life. I love you, and I want to be a positive force in your life, while at the same time being a defender, my own greatest defender of my dignity and my emotional needs. So I'm creating a reasonable qualification for you to meet in order to be allowed in my life. Note that I use the word reasonable, a reasonable qualification. Again, I never asked anything of my father that he's incapable of doing. In fact, this qualification that I've put in place, as I just described it to you earlier, is the minimum demonstration that I need to see satisfied in order to be content that, one, he acknowledges he mistreated me, and that this has had tremendously destructive effects throughout my life. Two, he's demonstrating genuine remorse for it. Do I really care if my father's ever cured of his emotional unhealth, which I suspect to be narcissism? Is that my goal? Is that my end goal, that he be cured before he and I can have a relationship? Well, I would certainly love to see him cured, but... That's not part of my qualification for him and I to have a relationship. Never have I made that seem like that's part of the qualification for him and I to have a relationship. He doesn't have to be cured for us to have a relationship. As long as he acknowledges he did wrong and he's demonstrating genuine remorse. My boundaries in the best interest of my emotional health, first and foremost, as I as I explained. But secondly, it's also in the best interest of my father. 
I have no control over him. I'm not trying to live his life for him. I'm not trying to tell him what to do. But if he genuinely cares for me and I stick to my boundary, it could have positive consequences for him. Right? So in that sense, it's it's the only tool I have to help him break free of unhealthy, abusive, distorted thinking that's keeping him from experiencing genuine contentment. So the boundary that I created, I didn't create out of hate. I didn't create it out of anger. It was created out of genuine love for myself and genuine love for him with a view of the greater picture in mind of all that's involved. If my dad should choose to never meet my requirements for us to have a relationship, this will be entirely on him a direct result of his choices and only his choices. But I cannot, under any circumstances, back down from the boundary I've put in place. To do so would be to undermine everything. I cannot and I will not ever go back to the emotionally unhealthy ways of my past, nor will I support it for other people. No, not even for family members will I do that. Maybe you're wondering how all this makes me feel. Well, it's not always easy. You know, the, the truth is I miss, I miss interactions with my dad. He has a lot of good qualities, but nothing excuses the damage that he's directly responsible for in my life, my brother's life, my sister's life, my mom's life. Nothing excuses the emotional abuse I endured from him when I was a helpless, innocent child, entirely dependent on him. The gross abuse of his responsibility and authority as a father and the tremendous loss and pain I've suffered in my life since, not to mention the harm I've caused myself and the harm I've caused others while under the lasting effects of his abuse. I look at my brother who spent decades in emotional agony, destroying himself with alcohol. I think of the mental and emotional torture he's endured daily. While my father enjoys a relatively calm life and the delusions that allow him to sleep at night, denying any responsibility for this ongoing inner turmoil my brother suffers from. You know, my brother suffers for the same reasons that explain the borderline personality disorder that I had to battle so hard to get an upper hand on. Without acknowledgement and demonstrations, demonstrations of genuine remorse, not just saying I'm sorry, that's not a demonstration of genuine remorse. The abuse my father is responsible for is utterly unforgivable. The damage he's caused is too serious, too far-reaching, and much too destructive to just shrug off once I gained a clear understanding of the true nature of that abuse. So my father must acknowledge it, and he must demonstrate genuine remorse if he's ever going to qualify to be allowed back in my life. There are grave, sweeping, large-picture issues in play here, You know, you have to shake off the pinhole spotlight vision, which is denial, and learn to see the greater picture of all that's in play in these circumstances to truly grasp the gravity of it all. So what happens when family members, in my case my dad, refuse to acknowledge the boundaries we put into place? Well, this is natural. It's to be expected. And so you might as well get used to it and have a plan in place for how you're going to deal with it. As I said at the outset, emotionally unhealthy people do not respect or even acknowledge such boundaries in most cases. That reminds me of gun-free zones and hardened killers, you know. They're the last people on earth who are going to check their pistol at the door. During special times of year, like holidays, you can bet your britches that relatives especially are going to test boundaries. So in the beginning, 
when you create your boundary, you have to be determined at all cost to enforce it. Otherwise, don't bother creating the boundary. Seriously, if you're not committed to following through and enforcing the boundary, don't bother. This also means then that you better be darn sure that your boundaries are well thought out before you put them in place. You might want to jot that down. Make darn sure your boundaries are well thought out and that you're willing to enforce them before you put them in place. Also, it's my recommendation that you don't just jump up to cutting people entirely out of your life as your first boundary. Start small and work up to that. You know, that boundary, not having my father in my life because he's not willing to do the very minimum that is required for him to be in my life, that's not my preference. My preference is not to have my... Let's say it this way. My preference is not to live my life not being able to have any contact with my father. That's not my preference. But you might remember once upon a time I said love, authentic love, sometimes takes choice out of the equation. Sometimes genuine love says this is what you must do. And that's the situation I've found myself in when I finally created that that boundary. So, in the circumstances of the person who, for example, asked the original question and the parents aren't even in the same state, I'll be honest, I'm not sure what the problem is because the only issue I can imagine is lack of enforcement. You know, let me repeat the question as it was written. Uh, How to deal with your long-distance parents when you have Uh, let's say, an emotional disorder after you've put up boundaries and they use the holidays or whatever to put a guilt trip on you or to try to get you to engage, all right? So do you got the scene in, in mind? You're in Arizona and your parents are in Indiana. You see, that's why I say in these circumstances, when the parents aren't even in the same state, this isn't a boundary problem. This isn't a problem about making boundaries. This is an enforcement problem. So if the issue is a lack of enforcement, that's not the parents' fault. Rather, it's your fault. It's the person not enforcing the boundary. So phones today have block features. Letters don't have to be opened. Nobody who shows up on your doorstep has to be let into your house. Packages can be returned to sender or denied delivery. The only reason anybody has access to you is if you are allowing it. Remember, you're a castle. There's a moat around your castle. People can only get in if you are letting the drawbridge down or leaving it down and just letting any kind of riffraff walk right into your castle. This is not complicated. You might want to make it complicated, or perhaps you don't respect the importance of enforcing boundaries. Maybe that's the problem you have. But the thing in itself is not complicated. The bottom line is this. If people are able to consistently ignore your boundaries... That's your failure, your fault, not theirs. And frankly, there's no excuse for it. No matter what excuse you can think of, there's no excuse for it. You know, early on when I started this work, one thing I quickly learned is that 99.9% of the time when I was asked the question about how to enforce boundaries, the person who was asking was never really committed with their boundary to begin with. For some reason, they believe the principle of boundaries changes when it involves somebody who's related to them, especially somebody like a parent or a sister. If this is your attitude, you're totally missing the point of boundaries and their purpose. So the real issue is, 
when are you going to create a boundary for real? Because boundaries that you don't enforce or that you collapse under every time they're tested, those aren't boundaries. No, that's, that's just meaningless talk. And meaningless talk is immeasurably more harmful than good. Meaningless talk undermines every single function a boundary is supposed to serve. I, I hope you understand that boundaries must be enforced by you. They're not something that anybody around you is obligated to enforce upon themselves. It's like you claiming that you're house training your dog while at the same time allowing him to consistently pee on your floor anytime he wants. <laughs> you know, every single time you allow your dog to freely pee in the house, while you're supposedly training him, quote-unquote, you're undermining every meager effort you make toward the training. Don't tell me you think there's some force in the universe obligating the dog to police himself. If you don't create the boundaries of no peeing in the house and then figure out a way to enforce that boundary, the dog's not going to do it for you. So earlier I alluded to the fact that just a couple of weeks before I wrote this article, I found myself in an awkward, painful situation which involved my boundaries being ignored. What happened there? Well, maybe by sharing the experience, you'll see that I can identify with the ongoing struggle that uh, many are experiencing, that it does affect me, and also that I'm not preaching anything here that I don't adhere to myself in sometimes difficult circumstances. What happened is this. I crossed paths with my dad in a public place. He was with a family friend of ours, and I had absolutely no way to avoid him. This alone was distressing for me. So as I made my attempt to get by him and leave this place, without looking in his direction or acknowledging, or acknowledging him, he said something nice to me, which specifically what he said was, It's good to see you, Brian. Now, a lot of sideline spectators and people who don't understand the subtleties involved in this situation might think that it was rude for me to ignore him. Because when he said that to me, I didn't acknowledge that he spoke. I just kept walking. And they'd probably think I could have shown him enough respect to at least nod in his direction or wave or say hello or something. He is my father, after all. But I'm not interested in what other people think. What I'm interested in is doing whatever it takes to never support or be pulled into emotionally unhealthy forms of thinking and of being a participant in it by any measure. That's what I'm interested in. Anybody who would question my actions and motivations can't begin to fathom the issues in play. They weren't emotionally abused for 30 years by the man. They didn't lose everything they ever cared for in their life as a direct result of the results of his abuse. They've not been forced to helplessly watch their own sibling's emotional agony for decades because of this man's abuse. They don't understand the denial and delusions the man depends on in order to enjoy life as he does at the expense of a woman and children he was responsible for taking care of emotionally. They don't understand the three lengthy letters written in great detail and care explaining clearly my disappointments with him and what he can do to begin to make things right. And they don't understand that given years of opportunity and benefit of the doubt, this man has never done a single thing to authentically demonstrate any genuine remorse for any of it. So I don't care about outward appearances as far as I'm concerned. There are universal issues in play here. And I care only that God who sees and knows every subtlety of the matter and who is able to peer into my heart and perceive my reasoning and my motivation as well as the injustices and the greater issues involved is agreeable to my handling of the matter. After all, he's not fooled by time or charm. When I was an innocent child and during the great harm 
that I would later have to sort out and undo, God was watching, and he's not forgotten. So God comes up because I'm expressing my genuine personal thoughts and feelings related to my personal life experience. It's not meant to alienate those who don't believe in God. So how did all this make me feel? It made me feel terrible. And this terrible feeling of ignoring my father and walking by, walking by him like he was a wall, that terrible feeling hung over me like a cloud for a solid week while I grappled with the various thoughts and feelings and processed it. How did I reinforce my boundary? Well, for one, as I've already explained, I did not acknowledge my father's attempt to blatantly ignore my boundary. For those of you who mistakenly think this was just a father showing care toward his son, you simply don't understand the subtleties in play. This was not a man selflessly greeting his son. Remember, this is a man who knows with no uncertainty, the boundaries I have three times patiently explained and detailed for him. So this is a man who was blatantly ignoring my wishes. He was testing my resolve, and he was refusing to recognize me as an adult free agent with feelings that must be respected and honored. And he was purposely purposely disrespecting me. You know, just because something is said sweetly, just because an unhealthy thing is done sweetly, does not make it healthy. It's still unhealthy, isn't it? My father knows very well that the only circumstances in which I will accept contact with him is if he makes the bare minimum effort to meet the requirements I've put in place. And he knows very well that he's not made the slightest effort to meet these requirements. In early episodes of this podcast, I explained how emotionally unhealthy parents, and especially narcissist parents, view their children, the, the perspective they have toward their children, which is the near equivalent of being an owner of inanimate property. And I've used an example of a chair in my house. You know, I care about the chair in the sense that it's mine, But do I care about the chair from the chair's point of view? Of course I don't. Instead, it's a totally selfish form of care. What the chair provides me. How it enhances my life. And, you know, love never has this perspective of other people. Rather, authentic love values other people's feelings, their perspectives, their thoughts, their individuality. So my father's greeting, in the context I've explained, was not a simple greeting. It was a reflection of this same attitude, a total disregard for my feelings, for my thoughts, for my needs, for my boundaries. So I could not, under any circumstance, make the mistake of viewing it as something harmless and thereby once again becoming a participant in this twisted dance of emotional unhealth that only I and people in similar circumstances could ever hope to truly understand the subtleties of. But I didn't stop there in the reinforcement of my boundary. No, later I got into contact with that family friend who was with my father, and uh, I asked to talk to him privately. I did this because I know that this man is somebody my father admires. So I explained everything to the friend that I've just explained to you here. I then asked him to make it clear to my father that I consider every violation of my boundaries as harassment, and that if he continued to ignore my boundaries in future scenarios, that I would take additional action. So the friend was taken aback, but he assured me that he would have a serious conversation with my dad and express everything that I asked him to pass on. Then I spent days reinforcing in my own head the reasons why I absolutely, without fail, have to do things the way I'm doing them. I also spent many days reminding myself of the seriousness and the gravity of the issues in play. I felt very sad, and I had to constantly remind myself 
that I'm in this situation not because of anything I have done or have not done, but that it's my father who is responsible for this mess. It began when I was born, and he has not learned a thing from his mistakes, nor has he ever acknowledged or accepted responsibility for his serious abuses, even now, 44 years later. Why not? Because I'm the first and only person to ever place true boundaries on him and to have the strength of character to enforce them. If somebody had done this for him decades ago, it might never have fallen on me. But here he is, still disregarding everything and everyone for his own selfish, self-serving, delusional interests. You know, from his perspective, I'm sure he thinks that he's being so nice, and here I am being so rude. That's the delusional part of it, that he, he can't see how he's turning all of that around and seeing it completely incorrectly. He's still trying to treat me like an inanimate piece of his property with total disregard and lack of respect for me as an adult free agent with my own thoughts, feeling needs, dignity, and inherent standalone rights. So you, who are dealing with similar circumstances, remind yourself often that you didn't create this situation. On the contrary, you're the only one doing anything to clean it up. It's a lonely responsibility. It's a lone hero's job, but somebody has to do it. So if you've made any progress at all, now is not the time to waver and slip slip and fall and be engulfed again into that whole cloud of emotionally distorted influence and thinking. There's more involved than simply your authentic recovery. Also involved is your responsibility to do the only thing you can do for your loved ones that has any real chance whatsoever of helping them also eventually come to their senses and make a change. Remember, nobody who's emotionally unhealthy can ever experience genuine contentment. Contentment and emotional unhealth, they're polar opposites. So steadfastly enforcing boundaries is the only path we have to act in the genuine best interests of ourselves and our emotional health. But it's also the only path we have to act in the genuine best interests of those we care about. So that one day, possibly, they too can enjoy genuine contentment. My friends, I'd like to remind you to visit thelastsymptom.com. Support my work with a donation if you if you get the itch. And uh, if you'd like to talk to me one-on-one, to see if I can help you sort some things out, you can schedule that conversation right from thelastsymptom.com. And here we are again. We've reached the encouraging finale. ago I took my three nieces to Walmart to the toy section as the girls were busy playing with all the toys there looking at all the new toys that they wanted me to buy for them my stomach started to rumble and I realized that I had to let out some gas So I looked to the left, and there was nobody. And I looked to the right, there was nobody. It was just me and my nieces. And I thought, this is the perfect timing. I can let this gas go, and nobody will be the wiser. So I let her rip.
turned out to be the foulest stench I've ever experienced in my life. But still, I thought, it's cool, and there's nobody around, and my nieces are too young to understand <laughs> what it is. All of the sudden, a family of four turned down the aisle that we were in. And as they were getting closer, I was starting to panic, but then I thought, wait a second. If they smell it, they're just going to think that one of my nieces has done this. Well, as this family of four got right up to where we were, my oldest niece swung around all of a sudden and she said, Uncle Brian, you stink. 